You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 140. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes, I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Ah, There's nothing like a break from the podcast, except for coming back to the podcast after a break and feeling so refreshed, so inspired, so incredibly excited to bring you this season of guests. I have been in Europe all summer. I was in uh, Switzerland, Germany, Ireland, the UK, and in Spain, where I went to give a couple of interviews and hang out with some friends. So in this interview, <laughs> uh, my voice is completely gone because I've been busy dancing and drinking and screaming all night. So, um, yeah, this podcast episode today, I've got that nice, raspy, gravelly voice. Obviously, not now because I'm back in Montreal, just like chilling in my bathroom as usual. But in the interview, you'll hear I'm a little, uh, I'm a little subdued. But that doesn't mean that today's guest isn't absolutely amazing. And I cannot wait to share the interview with you. Before I do, if you want to hear more about my adventures, you can go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. This is an independent podcast. And the only way that it is funded is through Patreon. And in return for your generous donation through Patreon, I give you a little extra podcast, a little behind the scenes look at my life as a traveling, teaching, gallivanting circus performer, darling. Yes. So updates are there. Even if you don't want to listen to my voice any more than this, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete anyway. As little as $3 a month helps this podcast so, so much continue to be the thing it is with the guests, such as my guest today, Alexei Goloborodko. Alexei is a Russian contortionist. In addition to contortion, he has trained in classical and modern dance and Chinese modern arts. He has performed in a variety of arts festivals and competitions, television programs, circuses, and shows, and he is currently in the Cirque du Soleil show Lucia as the closing act, and it is a stunning, beautiful act, if I may add. Here's my interview with Alexei Goloborodko. My name is Alexei. How do you say your last name? Oh, it's a tricky one. Yeah. Goloborodko. One more time. Ah, well, I, <laughs> I said <laughs> Goloborodko. Goloborodko. Exactly. Cool. Okay, correct. So, my name is Alexei, and I'm a Cirque du Soleil performer. I'm doing contortion. Yeah. For Luzia, since the show started. Cool. Did they make that role for you? Or how did that come about? It's a long story with me in Cirque du Soleil. When I was 12 years old, even before that, I saw a show of Cirque du Soleil on a DVD disc, and I fell in love with that Cirque. And I really wanted to be here. And then Cirque du Soleil came to Moscow, to Cirque School for audition. And my coach decided to go for that audition. If we pass it, good. If we don't pass it, well, we'll try next time. And we went there, we passed the audition. I was 12, maybe 13 years old. Everything was fine. They said, oh, you're a super flexible boy. We have never seen anything like that. But they said that by that time, the law has changed and kids couldn't perform in Cirque du Soleil anymore. Uh. So I couldn't join the show. And then when I turned 17, Cirque du Soleil came to Moscow again and did the same audition. And I decided to give it a try one more time. I passed second audition successfully. But since I was 17, I couldn't join any shows. And when I turned 20, 21, Tordesley emailed me and asked if I wanted to join a new creation, Luzia. And I really did. I really wanted. Yeah. And this is how it started. Wow. That's amazing. I think that's really cool for people to hear who want to work for Cirque du Soleil like you, like you can audition and then it takes nine years yep. before. 
actually it was a were. long long path yeah so going back to the beginning your childhood when you were zero no maybe not that you were always really flexible even when you were a little kid yeah well, when i was zero i was flexible as yeah? all of us <laughs> <laughs> all kids are very flexible mm -hmm. uh, but over time this flexibility goes away because we don't use it use it or lose it right so most people don't use it they lose it and i didn't do that <laughs> i started using my flexibility since i was three four years old i saw a commercial of a circus show in my hometown and i asked my mom to take me to that show just to watch it for fun and she took me there we watched the show we with my parents. And that night I told my mom that I wanted to be a circus performer and asked her to take me to a circus studio to start practicing, start doing something. And at that time it didn't matter what discipline it would be. It could be anything, mm -hmm. jumping, contortion, straps, whatever. I just wanted to be there. I just wanted to do something. Well, I was a kid, I wanted to have fun. Yeah. Well, my mom took me to a circus studio. My future coach tested me, showed me different different stuff from different disciplines. We tried juggling, we tried handstands, we tried some pull-ups on a bar. Then I showed him that I could do a bridge, a simple split, and then he said, well, let's try contortion. You're pretty flexible compared to other kids, mm -hmm. and we'll see how it goes. And it went very well. And when I was a kid, before I joined Circus Studio, I didn't like to, I didn't like to be active. I liked sitting and playing with toys by myself. I had like Legos, so I was very, you know, still. Okay. And I like to do it in split. When I was bored with sitting in split, I was lying down, moving around, and I saved my flexibility somehow by that time. But when I joined Circus Studio, of course I couldn't do a complete fold in a split. I couldn't do full split. Uh, I mean, com complete fault in a bridge. I couldn't do a full split. It was just like, you know, almost 90 degrees. But still, it was something. And when I started training in the circus studio, it went very well. And when I was getting results, it motivated me a lot. And I wanted mm -hmm. to develop more and more and more. And this is how it went. And then besides doing contortion, my coach was integrating other disciplines into my routine, like ballet exercises, modern dance training, elements of rhythmic gymnastics to develop uh, beautiful lines in legs, in arms, in the whole body, to teach your body move in a beautiful manner. Uh, we also did a bit of aesthetic gymnastics. And when I grew a bit older, I was doing sports wushu. So, and all this mix of all those disciplines is my genre, which is called dancing contortion. But of course, the base is extreme flexibility and stretching. Mm. And it makes sense with all the dance, like movement and gymnastics, those kind of styles like you're talking about with the line. But I'm really interested in that you studied wushu or these Chinese martial arts. What purpose did that serve in the contortion training? Well, it gave me a lot, actually, yeah. because uh, wushu is about variety of movements and it's about a currency. Every move should be very accurate. Oh, accuracy, yeah. Every movement should be accurate and you have to teach your body how to do that to be very precise in your movements. Mm. And it helps a lot in circus. And the other thing, they taught me how to do keen movements, like very sharp ones, and how to do sharp stops. So when you have to freeze, hold, and, th and then go on. Oh, that's really interesting, for sure. Because sometimes you think of like flexibility, especially when you go toward like more yoga or that kind of, like there's like flow and it's kind of really slow. With your work, there's sometimes these pops or these like phoom, yep. quick. And also Sorry. you can see it in my act in Lusia. Mm -hmm. And besides that, I had, when I was a kid, I had 11 different acts of different styles. One of them was Swan with music, Sin Sans, Carnival of Animals, Animal Carnivals. Okay, Whatever I don't know, it, well, but it sounds matter. beautiful. Yeah. Links will be in the show notes, guys. You can <laughs> all find it on YouTube. I, I had act Tango, Delusion, the, the famous act with two folding chairs. Uh, what else? I did Petrushka, Lyrical Mood, uh, God of the Sun, 
Secrets of East. Do you just like making acts or did your coach encourage you to have these different styles? Where did all that come from? We worked on that to develop skills of different characters and ah. to practice all those disciplines that I was training. Okay. And I really enjoyed the process. It was so fun because you get you get bored when you just keep training and don't show in what you have. Yes. If you have things to show that you trained, you just do an act you, and you express yourself. And I really enjoyed how it went. We started with Swan and it was my first act. Uh, and it was a mix of contortion. Contortion is the base and um, ballet dance. And we were building this act with my coach, Vladislav Rodin. And he invited another teacher for ballet classes. Her name is Natalia, Natalia Peripelkina. She is one of the best ballet teachers in my hometown. And she's very successful now too. Cool. She keeps practicing. Uh, and three of us built this act and it was, it was a success. It was a very beautiful one. And it wasn't like a parody or something reminding a girl's style, style of doing swan or yeah. ballet swan. It was circus, boy, Beautiful swan. Yeah, work. Love that. Actually, it did, didn't even occur to me in, the, in my notes, so I didn't really make a question about this. But approaching, because in mainstream, it's usually women who practice stream flexibility. What is it like to be a male in the industry doing contortion? Well, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a male doing contortion. In so the you tell me how it goes. Did you tell me? <laughs> well, what I see is I would assume it would give you more opportunity because it's different, right? Circus is really interesting when we have differences. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're a, a male body doing, a man doing it is... Yes, you're right. Mostly contortion, uh, girls do contortion mostly. Uh, when... A boy start doing contortion, it puts a lot of responsibility on a boy because mm. if you do worse than girls, you ask the question, well, why, why do you do that if you're worse than girls? But if you want to be really good, if you want to be successful, you have to be better than girls. And being mm. better than girls is a hard thing. It's really hard. You have to work a lot. And since I loved it, I love to work, I did so, and I became successful. And I just, as I mentioned, as I said, it's not only about contortion, not only about extreme flexibility and so on. It's a mix of different disciplines, different pieces of arts. And this is what makes me different from other contortionists, because usually how it works. You do a trick, like, I don't know, let's say a bridge. You stand up, take a bow and go on. Do another trick, handstand with contortion, stand up, take a bow and go on. But if it's changed, if you do movement by movement and the audience does not see, doesn't mention how one position changed to the other one, it makes huge difference. You put choreography to your act, it becomes fluid, and it works very well, as you can see. <laughs> I'd say it's not doing too bad for you. Yeah. Yeah, the art of the transitions, right? And even now, there are boys con contortionists, but they're very rare. And, well, being among ladies, eh, very nice. Not so bad. <laughs> not so bad. It is good. <laughs> what do you consider contortion versus someone who's just extremely flexible? Well, you have to decide why you want to practice flexibility, why, why, why do you want to stretch? What's your goal? Contortion is an art and it's about developing a skill and then put it in an act to show to the audience. This is art, Yay. you show it to people. The question is why do they want to be flexible? Mm. Even for sports, you have to develop a certain level of flexibility, but this level of flexibility differs for different sports. If you reach extreme flexibility in, I don't know, basketball, it's not going to work. Well, <laughs> it will work, but in the worst direction. Uh -huh. It will make you play worse. If you want to be rhythmic gymnastic, of course, you need good flexibility. You need to work a lot on it, but it's a different thing. And also, rhythmic gymnastic girls, they perform. They show what they've got to the audience and to the judges. Yeah. About yogas? 
they practice stretching for themselves, for, I don't know, maybe they do it for health, maybe they do it for spiritual practice. It's a very tricky question because there are so many different options and so there are so many different answers. <laughs> no, it's true, but I love your answer about having the why and how there's like a context to it, right? You know, like, because there are rhythmic gymnasts who then, once they retire from that, they go on and they become contortionists, but it's a different kind of craft. Yeah, it is different. It. Yeah, it's a good point. But for rhythmic gymnastical girls, it's easier to become a circus performer, a contortionist, or do some aerial or yeah, sure. or something like that. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, they have a lot of difficulties because they have to learn new stuff anyway. It's one thing. And the other thing that they need to get rid of what they learned before because they're used to their item clubs, balls, mm, uh, mm. ribbons, and all these movements are in their head and it's that they've been practicing this for years and stop doing that stop doing these patterns is a very tricky thing it's very hard and when they switch rhythmic gymnastic to circ or to dance they have to work a lot on this switch so i have to ask you some boring questions and i'm sorry because i know that you get these questions a lot but does it hurt to be as flexible as you are no yeah no. <laughs> Does it hurt? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. No, it doesn't hurt. Uh, of course, any type of stretching relates to a certain level of discomfort. To reach flexibility, you have to overcome this discomfort. And there is a, mis there is a misunderstanding of how to do that. Mm. If you do it, if you want to rush and you're like eager for the result, you want to make it quick, it's not going to work. You're going to hurt yourself or a student. It takes time. Uh, and with time, with practice, you get small result, then it starts growing up and goes all the way up. But for sure, when you get certain level, progress stops and then it goes like that. And He's making a straight line with yeah, his it, finger, it, it's guys, making, so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you cannot see me, but <laughs> you can imagine that it's making uh, straight and then progress goes up a bit slower because you reach certain level of skill flexibility and this point reaches relatively quickly mm -hmm. and then the process slows down and goes up and this part is getting harder regarding your question if it's painful if it hurts no because i was trained in a proper manner with my coach and he developed this method very well. We started with little one, with little things, and then we were pr progressing very slowly. Okay. So I never got injured from my contortion. I never felt like, well, I want to give up because it's too painful, because it's like too demanding. No, nothing like that. Yeah. Nice. I realized that to reach certain level. I need to overcome discomfort that relates to any kind of stretching. I realized that and that realization helped me go on. What tips would you give to someone who's having trouble with that discomfort? So it, it was discomfort, but it wasn't like pain. Yeah, you're not in pain, but you know, like people who are worried or scared or would say like, oh, this is uncomfortable and I don't know if I can get to the next point like do you focus on your breath are there certain things you think do you just like go to a pretty island in your head and then wake up and you're in a stretch like what first of all i would say you need to identify what kind of pain or discomfort you have because mm. if we say discomfort that relates to stretching uh, is one thing but if you feel pain it can be sharp pain maybe it's like pinching or something and if it's that you have to stop obviously if it's discomfort from stretching, you can go on and, well, overcoming this discomfort, you just have to realize to get more flexibility, you need to, and overcoming this discomfort when you're stretching is the work you put for the result. You just, you just need to understand what your goal is and how to achieve it. And to achieve this goal, getting flexibility, you need to overcome the discomfort. If you want that, you do it if you like well <laughs> it doesn't work doing that maybe maybe you stop doing that 
They had told me that you can bench press 90 kilos. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> that's, I mean, I mean, how much do you weigh, if you don't mind me asking? 64. So that's, that's pretty badass. No, oh, well. Comparatively, <laughs> right? How much of your time do you spend on your strength training versus your flexibility, like your stretching? 50 50, okay. 60 40. And it leans more to stretching. Okay. Because also there is a balance between strength and flexibility. If you are too flexible and you don't work on your strength, you cannot control your movements proper, properly. It's one thing. And the other thing that you may start having problems because your muscles don't support your vertebrae, don't support your body structure. But on the other hand, if you get too strong and don't work enough on your flexibility, you will start losing flexibility. And for me, it's always about finding that balance. And of course, it dips down towards stretching and okay. flexibility training. For example, when we, when we started working uh, on Lucia, mm -hmm. and when we were creating this act I'm, I'm performing on Lucia, I started doing more handstands comparing to what I did before. And at one point, I started feeling like I get more, I get more strong, and I felt like, well, my flexibility changes. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I need to start working more on my flexibility without reducing handstand training. And then I brought this balance, this disbalance back to balance. So I, I managed that. It just as an example, you know? Yeah. And this is how it works. So you were doing a lot of handstand training. Yeah. And then you started to feel that your flexibility wasn't or like you couldn't access it or go as far or you weren't getting no, the it stretching. It wasn't as like well? it interfered with my flexibility. I just started feeling that my body feels different. Uh -huh. But my flexibility didn't reduce. If I did not start m working more on my flexibility, it would happen. But I noticed that tendency that my body started feeling differently. I started working more on flexibility and brought this disbalance back to balance. Nice. You, you, you must find these subtle feelings, what your body tells you. Yeah. And on the other hand, when I work more on flexibility and less on strength, I start feeling that my body responses to, to me also differently. And I feel like, well, I'm more loose. I have less control in my performance. Mm -hmm. And for me, it means that I need to bring more strength. That makes sense. I love that. No, it's so oh, cool. Oh, it's about balance. Yeah, and it really speaks to like um, something that I don't think we talk about enough as movers and artists is like that ability to kind of not only self-reflect like mental, emotional therapy, you know, that kind of spaces, but like physically in your body, being able to take stock of like what you may not even know you need yet, but you can feel like it's starting to go in one direction and kind of correct even before there's a problem. Yeah, for sure. Before you do something, you need the feedback from your body, mm -hmm. how it feels. And you feel like, well, I need to work more on that or on this. You just start doing that. But it's really easy to speak like that, to say this when you have 20 years of experience. Hmm. <laughs> Very good point, Alexei. <laughs> Very good point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This experience is kind of a tricky thing. And when you teach someone, it's your, responsi your responsibility as a coach to find this pr proper proportion. Mm -hmm. And my coach did it very, very good, very successfully. Was he a contortionist? No, never. He was helping his son when his son was young and he was going to a circus studio, he, as a father, wanted to help his son to practice better, to go further and nice. so on. And he helped his son first. And his son became an artist. And then he started training with me because he kept going to the same circus studio. And when I arrived there and my mom asked him to take me for individual lessons, not with the group, he took me and we started training and since then we go on and even now he helps me we talk over the phone every day 
Oh wow, yeah, I was gonna ask if you were still. Yeah, we we are still in touch. in touch. We in in a really good relationship and cool. So gives me advices, su suggestions, how to make it better, how to make my performance better, what I have to work on a bit more, and also he helps not only with flexibility and routine, and he also taught me his methods he was applying to my training. And he also teaches me, well, I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it without, without sounding very, you know, pompezos. Without sounding very what? Well, doesn't matter, maybe this word doesn't exist. I just oh, no, 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 you can do it. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Bombezos. Bombezos. It, without sounding very bombezos. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he teaches me not only how to be flexible, how to do my uh, act, how to do all this stuff. And I can say he teaches me the way of living and dealing with difficult situations in my life. Oh, he's a mentor. Mentor. Yeah, yeah. Like. And when there is a difficult situation, he helps me a lot. We, we, we talk a lot and he gives me advice. It's not only contortion related, but in life in general. I'm super happy and I realized how lucky I am that I have such a person in my life. Is it painful for you not to stretch? Like how many days can you go without stretching? It's not painful, but it gets annoying at some point. Yeah. For example, if, if I'm sick, if I'm ill and I don't stretch, I lay down in the bed and recover from my illness, sickness. Uh, my body gives me signals, well, it's time to wake up and do something. <laughs> <laughs> Takes two, three days. Okay. But when everything is good, I keep practicing every day. And when we have a day off, I also do stretching, but not a lot. Let's say 40, 30 minutes per day. Okay. Just to kind of like... Just to... Feel like a... Yeah, just just to feel it, exactly. Yeah, cool. And when you are on days where you're performing, or how long does it take to warm up for you? Every time it takes me 40 minutes for warm up before each show. For example, when we have three shows per day, I do three warms up. Yeah. So three times by 40 minutes. Okay. And then when you get off stage, do you do, do, you cool, down I do cool down or do anything yeah. like that? Yeah. What do you do for your cool down? This is something people ask a lot. Well, I, I can show you. It's hard to explain. <laughs> I do some exercises to... Is it more strength-based? Do you just like... It's like strength lie down mixed or... with flexibility. Okay. So I, I use my flexibility, but I control with my muscles. For example, I lie down on the floor, my legs on the floor, and I bring them all the way up. I go to the chest stand. I lower my legs towards the floor, and then I come back, I raise my legs up again and lower them back to the floor. And I do it in a slow manner. Mm. Four counts going one way and four counts going the other way. And let's say I do it eight, 12 times just to get my muscles to good tonus before, before I finish my cool down. And then I, of course, do compensation. I go to child pose, I relax there, stay for a minute, minute and a half. And when I feel like, well, I'm in a good tonus, I'm not too loosey, I'm not too tight, I'm ready to go. I put something on like a shirt or well, hoodie and go relax. Because keeping this warm after your training and after cool down is very important. Because if your warm goes away quickly, your muscle may spasm, may feel awkward. And nobody wants that. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> Along the lines of like the doesn't it hurt, blah, blah, blah. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but do you have any like diagnosis or any medical condition or anything that like, no, you're just a normal human chilling in the world? Just as I said at the very beginning that if I didn't use my flexibility since I was a kid, I would lose it. And since I started training when I was four and I never stopped, I have it, I developed it more. But let's say if I stop now, of course, I will lose most of it. Okay. And I don't have any diagnoses or like, Nothing like what this. they say, ADS syndrome yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know contortionists who do, mm -hmm. and they say that it's fine. They just strengthen and then they can do their jobs just as easy. Well, I it, it's not my but case. No. You heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> Maybe not. Have you ever tried to have a job that wasn't circus? No. Well, when I was finished in school, I wanted to attend university and study physical education. I was, well, 17 years old. 
I prepared everything, all the subjects. I passed all the exams I needed for attending university. I came there and they said, well, we closed that department. You had to come a year earlier. And I decided to go and study accounting. So I have a diploma in... Accounting? Accountant. I'm a professional accountant, but wow. I never worked. I actually, my taxes, I need to do them <laughs> for this year, so I'll send them your way. Well, I have to warn you, I never worked as an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so probably I'm the worst one in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but the only accountant who can do their exactly. figures in a split, so that's pretty cool. I found out that that department I just was talking about, physical education, reopened and they started doing distant education. I oh. passed all the exams, attended university, and now I'm studying. Oh, cool. So you're studying physical education. Yes. Look at him go. And is your hope to then teach contortion just like your um, coach did? Why not? But for now, my main goal is to keep performing. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. I, I, I do teach some contortion uh, at CERC. Do you have any flexibility goals? Me? Yeah. Flexibility goals. Well, I do complete fault. I was gonna say, it like, I really hard to Could go you... farther than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now mostly I'm focused not on reaching new level of flexibility. Now I'm mostly focused on how I do, how I express, how I show my flexibility. Mm. For me, it's now the most important point. So it always was important for me yeah. because it's a mix of different disciplines as we, just, as we were just talking in the beginning and especially now I, I do my extreme flexibility but for me most importantly not what you do but how you do and I think it applies to everything for example the other day I went to uh, a circus festival here in Alicante just, oh, cool. just to watch it and there was a guy he was juggling with very simple tricks, just three claps. But the way he did it was very beautiful. It was very lyric. It was very, you know, floating, very smooth. I watched, I realized that this act was not hard acrobatically. Simple tricks, simple movements and everything. But the way he did them was amazing. Mm. I enjoyed and these four minutes for me was like, wow. Um, so how are you doing that? How am I doing? What? Yeah, it's a weird question, I know, but I think it is because I think it is where people get stuck sometimes is you can, it's very straightforward how you train flexibility. There's drills, there's um, consistency. You have certain methods to approach it. Strength training is the same way. There's, you know, you lift weight and then you lift more weight and that's how you get stronger. But the how you do it, like how do you work on the how? Do you video yourself? Are you still studying other ways of dance? Like, what's your approach to that? Uh, for sure, I do ballet exercises. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I watch videos, I analyze them. I see what I could do better, what I could do different. In my childhood, when it all started, I was working a lot on ballet and modern dance, rhythmic gymnastics as well, and aesthetic gymnastics too. And it helped me to develop uh, the posture, uh, the way of movements, and I still keep practicing it. And I, I think this is the answer to your question, how how I keep doing that. Yeah. By, by practicing all those disciplines along with developing stretching and flexibility. Or in my case now, maintaining and making sure that I do it in the way I do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you totally. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. And your character in Lucia, can you talk a bit about who that is? Well, Lucia is a Cirque du Soleil show inspired by Mexican culture. So the, the word Lucia consists of two parts. One part means light and the other part rain. And each act in the show represents some part of Mexican culture. And I am an alebrije in the show. And alebrije is fantastic creature from Mexican culture. And there was a guy, Pedro Linares, Something, something like that. If I pronounce it wrong, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so there was a guy, Pedro Linares, and in 1943, somewhere there, he fell ill and he got hallucinations. He was seeing images of different 
animals mixing in one creature. And when he was seeing these pictures, he could hear the sound telling him Alebrije. Mm. And this word didn't mean anything. It was just just a word, just yeah. a combination of sounds. And when he recovered, he started doing piñatas in the forms of his hallucinations. And these piñatas got very popular in Mexico and it became a part of Mexican culture. And now I am an alebrije. I am a mix of different animals melting one into another one, synthesis of different things in one piece. And when I perform, uh, I sometimes represent a snake or a tiger. I'm kind of hunting my leg. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's so cool. I didn't know any of that. I saw Lucia when it opened in Montreal in, when was that, 2018? 19? Uh, when it opened? 16. 16. 16. Holy shit. I didn't know any of that. I knew it was about Mexico. I knew all of that, but about your act particularly. Did they give you all of those resources and then say, make an act from this? Did you study it? Like, how did you make these decisions? <laughs> About when you're hunting it, it, it your was, leg. It or... wasn't me. It was uh, during the creation when we worked with my choreographer, mm -hmm. uh, Sylvia Getrudix. She knew about that character. She knew that uh, my character should be Alebrije. And she explained me everything I just told you. What it is yeah. and how it became viral and why we're doing it now. And when we started working on this character, she was like, okay, try this move. But imagine that you are a snake now make it quality of movement snake. I tried. Then she was like, now try as if you're a swan. And I tried to make it in a different style. And then now try like you're hunting something, hunting your leg, hunting something external. I did so. And then when we had these pieces, we started melting them all together. And this is how it became what we have now. She knew about this act and she worked with an assistant and the coach was there. Not my coach, but the coach from Sur Soleil, Michael Lanfer. He helped me a lot. We worked on new handstands, on new contortion positions as well. It was very, very productive team and I'm very proud that I was a part of that team. Uh, and honestly, I miss that creation time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. At the very beginning, it was, you know, it was kind of hard because you arrive to studio very early. You stay there, you work and you come back home pretty late. And it was very demanding, very tiring. But now I miss that mm. <laughs> because I realized that I, 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 enjoy, I enjoyed it a lot. And when the process went on, I enjoyed it. But now, over time, I enjoy it more and more. <laughs> and when I say I do it even more. <laughs> so what do you think? I mean, obviously you'll continue to perform for a while. I think, I don't even want to ask you this as a question because I think a lot of people are like, oh, but you can only do contortion until you're like 30 and then you're done, right? Which you know and I know isn't true. It's not true at all. <laughs> no, it's bullshit. It is, indeed. I actually... This isn't even a, I actually think it's one of the disciplines that offers the most longevity. It's a misunderstanding that you can do contortion only until 30s or whatever. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because when I was 15 years old, uh, people were saying, oh, you're just 15, you're too young. When you turn 18, you will have troubles because of what you do. I was like, well, well okay. <laughs> I turned 18, people were saying, well, you're only 18 years old. You will get troubles when you turn 21. We'll see how it goes. I was like, okay, well, we'll see. I turned 21 and people were saying, 21, you're still too young. Your body is recovering very fast. You will have troubles when you turn 25. <laughs> okay, I wait, I turned 27. And I can say that I'm in the best shape I ever had. And this misconception that you can do contortion only up to 30 comes from wrong methods. People do that because they try to rush. They don't follow 
the rules they have to follow and they hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Not contortion hurts them, they hurt themselves. And this is where this misunderstanding comes from. Because as you know, uh, yogis in India, they do it for all their lives. They have a different goal. It's not their goal to perform the asanas, the, the poses. They do it for spiritual practice. They don't have to show all these things because it's a lifestyle. In our case, we do a position, we do a trick, and we do it, why? Because we want to show it for the audience. But the idea is kind of, kind of the same. You can practice it all your life, but the question is, do you really want that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to perform when you are 50? Mm -hmm. If it's your lifestyle, it makes sense. You do it for yourself. You do it for your spirit, for your health, for your body. It doesn't matter. But do you really want to perform when you're 50, when you're 60? Maybe not. Maybe mm -hmm. you're not going to look nice when you're 60 years old. I mean, speak for yourself. I'm going to look amazing when I'm you're 60 You're going to look amazing. Old, so. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about myself, for sure. <laughs> so what, the, what would you want next? Like, where do you go? You have this beautiful solo act, like finishing act for Cirque du Soleil, tent show. Like, what would be your next move? What do you dream of doing next? Another creation? Uh, if Lucia stops one day, but I don't, I don't think it's going to stop no, because people love it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to, to do another creation because, just as I said, I really enjoyed it. I, well, I yeah. loved it. And it would be nice to do something else uh, in contortion discipline. But what do I do after contortion? Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll become a coach. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do something else. Maybe I'll do... I don't you do know. my taxes? Uh, maybe I do taxes in, <laughs> no, in a contortion kidding. position and, yeah. I, <laughs> and I'll ask for really big salary. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> because for I'm sure. doing your taxes in a contortion position. Did you it's for sure. Unique. <laughs> <laughs> Alexi, thank you so much for this interview. I have one more question for you. I ask all of the guests this. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? So, like when you started. And you can think about the beginning of your career however you want, when you started to get paid, when you started actually performing. Like, what is something, if you could go back and tell yourself something, would really have helped you? So, your question is, what yeah. would I tell to myself when I started performing? Yeah, what advice? Or when I started training when I was a kid? Because these two things are kind of different. If I replied to that one, uh, what would I tell to myself uh, when I started doing circus when I was four years old? I would tell myself, I'll listen to your coach more. <laughs> 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 what do I tell to myself when I started performing? Let me think. What else would it be? That would be the one. Listen to your coach more, even now. <laughs> listen to your coach. Yeah. Nice. So anyone out there who wants a career like Alexis, yeah. listen to your coach. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. Um, I don't remember who said that. And I don't know how to translate it into English, but I'll try. One gets success when the one doesn't make mistakes and doesn't go slow on his path. Okay, say that one more time. Okay. Um, one. One gets success. Get success, okay. When he doesn't make mistakes. When he doesn't make mistakes. When he does make mistakes. Okay. And when he's not too slow on his path. And when he's not too slow on his path. Yes. So you're successful if you don't make mistakes and you don't go slow. Exactly. It's a paradox. Because not to make mistakes, you have to, you have to take things slow to oh. be precise what you're doing. But if you are too slow, time goes on and you stay behind. And this is why this paradox is very important to, to, to get the success. I, I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but actually it is what it is. And I think it's the way it works. What would I tell to your listeners? In this con context, you need to find someone who can help you with your, with your dreams, with your goals. And I wish you luck not to make mistakes and wish you luck to realize that you have to find your own pace and go 
on your path with these ideas in mind. So don't make mistakes and don't go too slow. Dude, that's beautiful. It was not me. <laughs> it's someone says. <laughs> <laughs> Alexi, thank you again. This is thank amazing. You. And that's the interview, folks. Thanks for listening. If you love what you're listening to and you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Like go right now. I promise there is no better time than the present to just go support the causes you believe in, like independent podcasting for the circus arts. Patreon.com slash the artist athlete is the place to go. For more training tips and inspiration, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at shannon.mckenna.ariel. And my website is Shannon McKenna Ariel. Dot com. But just patreon.com slash the artist athlete and sign up to become a Patreon, just like these wonderful people. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website domupsidedown.com. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee, and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.